Okay, Vicky, off you go. Uh, thanks, Karen. Um, so basically the aims of today's session ultimately is the considerations involved around returning to work. Um, I mean, I appreciate that we might have lots of businesses here and some might be running as they were um, for others, depending on the sector, for example, hospitality. Um, nobody is at work because obviously government have prevented doing so. So what we are going to look at is some of the considerations around um, how we return to work um, when we bring colleagues back to work. but We'll also look at some of the laying off provisions and short time working. Now, these have been in the Employment Rights Act um, from the start when it was incepted in 1996. Um, lots of employers don't necessarily know about them and certainly um, experience and research would tell us that actually lots of employers have never actually put laying off or short time working into uh, employees' contracts of employment. So some considerations um, regarding these will be considered as well. Um, I'm going to talk about changing employment contracts almost as a theme that will run through it um, because logically the rule of thumb is that when a contract of employment is already agreed and enforced you can't make unilateral variations to contracts um, because essentially then you would be in breach of contract as an employer um, but sometimes that there is going to be needs potentially to change uh, employees terms and conditions of employment and actually some of the issues around that um, and sadly I think one of the hardest things but the reality of what businesses are facing at the moment is that there is going to come a point in time where potentially um, businesses have to make employees redundant um, very sad and it's kind of an emotional time and I think that in, a, in law we have a tendency to almost be quite black and white about it and we almost forget that human element um, but actually it can be quite distressing for those involved in terms of employees but actually as part you know as a, a as somebody who runs a business um you, you we're human we get close to people and actually it can be quite an emotive time for businesses as well but ultimately how we can um manage the process um and also i think just a reminder really that when you are making employees redundant there are people who will actually survive the redundancy procedure and actually a lot of the times you need to pick those back up as well because obviously it impacts on motivation and engagement um i am not going to discuss um health and safety as part of this session um primarily because we haven't got enough time but the reality is health and safety is paramount when we are considering um employees returning to work um in a legal sense, but obviously from a business point of view, um, businesses need to be able to demonstrate that they have a, sell, um, a safe work environment because it gives employees confidence when they are considering coming back to work. And actually your consumers as well um, take confidence in the fact that they, they can actually attend your businesses or you know, buy services from you when that's a, a safe environment as well. Um, obviously the employer is under both a statutory and a common law duty um, to make sure there is a, a safe workforce. So I would suggest just as a, a signpost, if you like, that compliance with government guidelines um, will certainly help and become good evidence um, should any employees come to you and say, actually, I don't want to return to work because I don't believe the environment is safe. Um, so what I would suggest for any you know anybody here who is considering return to work that actually you make yourself familiar with the health and safety guidance um, on the HSE website and um, they also obviously risk assessments become paramount at the moment um, and there's lots of templates and things that can actually help you with your business um, in terms of health and safety and depending on the type of business that you've got there's quite specific um, risk assessment templates that could be available to you to help you so Moving on then, just to give you a very quick overview of the furlough update. Now, I know that this has obviously gone out. Um, it was briefed out by the government last week. Um, but if you have employees at the moment that aren't currently on furlough, but you are actually considering putting them on furlough for the time being, the 10th of June is absolutely the last date in which you can place employees on furlough to actually register them with the HMRC. From the 1st of July, we moved to this idea of a flexible furlough um, so ultimately employees will be able to work part-time so say for example you've got a member of staff who is normally uh, on a five day a week contract um, but has been on furlough up to now you could bring them back for two days a week um, and then claim the three days a week back via the, the furlough scheme um, from the 1st of August obviously employers start paying um, employees national insurance and pension contributions 
um, but furlough in terms of rates at the moment in July um, and August will stay at maintained at 80%. From the 1st of September, this actually drops. So the government then will only reimburse 70% of the salary. Now, it depends on how, if you were placing employees on furlough, how you actually set it up in that if you had agreed with your employees that they would get 100% of pay on furlough, then that would need to continue, obviously from September then. Um, whereas at the moment you might be making just 20% of their salary um, from September, the 1st of September, that will increase that you would, as an employer, need to make up the 30% and you can claim the 70% uh, from the government up to that maximum of £2,190. Um, and obviously national insurance and pension contributions on top. Um, from the 1st of October, government obviously will reduce the amount of furlough that um, businesses can claim um, up to 60%. So again, employers are required to top up their up to the 80% if that's what you've agreed with your employees, um, or if you agreed 100%, um, then you need, you need to make that payment. There is nothing wrong, um, technically, with um, going into agreement with employees during this period, certainly from the 1st of August, to actually see whether or not employees would agree to the lower amounts. Um, as and when the you know the government dropped the payment schemes because the reality is that actually from August for businesses there's suddenly even more of a financial uh, liability if you like to businesses um, and the reality is this financial pressure is going to increase um, come October and certainly when it the furlough scheme ends on the 31st of October and the scheme closes completely um, the liability for businesses is exactly as it would be um, in terms of wage bill and um, as per every employee who is employed. Um, so it, it, it's very much about you need to be sticking to what was previously agreed and I would like to think that most businesses did obviously enter into agreements when furlough um, came about. Um, even if um, what is a sensible as well is when you are considering asking employees to return to work um, part of furlough is that ultimately employees have to be available for work um, but what I would kind of suggest from a HR perspective is that whilst um, what on furlough there is a need for urgent recall that you can have staff back there there comes about um, a reasonable approach because it's all well and good saying to employees right I need you back in work tomorrow but the reality is for actually caregivers um, lots of us you know have, have parents and um, might have children at home who have not started yet going back to school and um, nurseries are still closed so they might have access to childcare so considering what is reasonable um, and one of the things I would say all the way through this is consultation with employees becomes key to make sure you, you really, really understand the needs of your employees, because at some point, yes, you know, we will lose staff. Uh, I think for, for every business, that is a reality. Um, but for those staff that we retain, we really want to be in a position that, you know, we're seen to be good employers, that we've won hearts and minds, that employees actually come out of this period really trust in their employers um, so some considerations there for you um, so when we talk about bringing employees back it's almost like well actually do we bring back everybody and how do we do that safely and who do we decide who do we decide who we bring back um, and obviously we've got that scenario where we might have people employed with us who are clinically vulnerable and our shielding. Um, so I suppose the common sense route is that actually um, maybe we should consider volunteers coming back first. So it's, you know, it's all well and good to consult your employees and say, actually, we are reopening our business from whichever date and we would like to understand our employees' thoughts and processes, uh, thought process on bringing people back. And actually, if there is volunteers, because I, I, I know a lot of you might be working from home at the minute and if you're anything like me and Karen I think we'd be quite happy to go back into work if they suddenly opened and said you can come back and it'd be like I'm in I'm in um, and you will have people in that scenario who are quite happy to return to work and um, you then will have that scenario of actually people who are really really fearful you know mental well-being through COVID-19 is is a reality some people are absolutely petrified of what returning to work means especially when you think that actually some of your employees might need to get on public transport 
Um, so real, realistically, consult, trying to understand um, what people's viewpoint is. Um, obviously, if people are caring for people who are shielding themselves, those are the considerations. Um, if you are only bringing back a certain number of employees, um, then care should be taken in terms of who you bring back. Um, and if I sort of highlight there the issue around clinically vulnerable and shielding, um, the logic is that actually you should try and leave these till the absolute last minute because government guidance is that they are socially distanced and removed, if you like, from the workplace where possible. Um, having said that, what was really interesting the other day is um, I was involved in, an, in another e-clinic and the question was asked by a member of staff saying, I've got um, a, a person who works for me who is shielding and they absolutely want to come back to work and what do I do? And the reality is if you have employees who are clinically vulnerable and shielding um, and they're absolutely adamant that they want to return to work, then let them. Um, and that almost seems shocking, um, but I actually checked the government guidelines on it and shielding um, guidance that went out is actually, this is what we recommend, but it is ultimately your choice. Um, all I would say is if you are considering um, a return for people who are clinically vulnerable, or shielding, the logic is, is make sure that you absolutely minute any dialogue um, so that, you know, any conversations that have taken place are recorded um, so that if there was anything that came about later that you've got a document that said, actually, you know, we did recommend that this employee stay at home, um, but they really, really wanted to come back to work. Um, and obviously, I would suggest in terms of risk assessment, this becomes paramount um, when you are dealing with somebody who is potentially clinically vulnerable or shielding. Um, what you need to be mindful of in, in terms of when you are selecting who comes back is ultimately potential claims for um, discrimination. Um, because if you were basically saying that everybody who's clinically vulnerable needs to come back to work and um, otherwise they were going to be dismissed or you were going to stop pay, ultimately you subject your business to potential claims for discrimination. Um, because those who are clinically vulnerable or shielding are likely to be, and I caveat that likely to be, depends on the condition, um, uh, disabled for the purposes of the Equality Act. Um, so it's well worth considering that. And again, over 70s, don't just assume that because you've got an employee who is over 70 that they can't work and um, they should be almost put into that bracket of um, shielding because that's not the case. And if you've got um, an older employee who wants to return to work, as long as there are safeguards in place and they are documented, then that's OK. Um, there is always an issue, um, and I don't know if any of you kind of think of oh, this might happen in your workplace. What happens if ultimately you are trying to reopen your business um, or get people back off furlough um, and they are point blank refusing? Um, and I, I'm always one of those who don't advocate disciplinary procedures straight away. But ultimately, as part of that process, you might find that that becomes necessary. Now, I would never <laughs> suggest it if you don't come back you're fired you know that that really doesn't work but ultimately actually having conversations with employees to try and understand what what is the, the bone of contention what is the point that they are refusing to work because it might not be that they feel unsafe while they're at work it could be that they're saying i i'm happy to come back to work but i don't feel safe in getting back to work um so, you know, if there is a public transport issue, so it could be around, you know, conversations such as, well, perhaps if you're worried about traveling to work on the tube, on the, the bus, on the tram, at nine o'clock, four or nine o'clock in the morning start, and actually they're worried about peak hours traveling, could it be that actually you could bring them in later where they're able to travel to work in a, in a less congested environment? Um, and also, when we consider bringing employees back, do you need to bring them back into a role that they were previously doing? Because what you could consider is for a period of time having alternative work where actually um, they could then be able to work from home. Um, so obviously, if you had had those discussions and then employees were still absolutely refusing to work, then at some point you might need to invoke the disciplinary process. What I will say is that obviously, even though COVID-19 exists, the law still exists. So the laws relating to um, disciplinary 
procedures are still in force, so investigation hearing um, before you then invite for a disciplinary hearing. Um, but again, any documented conversations along the way, because if you did, did, if you did ultimately make a dismissal, um, if your employee has more than two years service, they could argue a case for um, unfair dismissal. So it is worth considering, you know, all the procedural elements. Um, if you want help and guidance in terms of running effective disciplinary procedures, um, then the ACAS website um, will be really helpful. And the CIPD website, um, which is, you know, the HR professional body, is a really good place where you can get um, advice and guidance as well. Um, ultimately, just, uh, you know, an additional point in terms of pay, if um, somebody goes off unauthorised, which is where effectively they should be at work, um, but they've refused, unauthorised absence is without pay. Um, so you wouldn't have to worry too much about um, wage claims that come off the back of that. Um, obviously, and I say that broadly, depending on your own terms and conditions of employment and your own procedures or policies that you might have in place um, in your workplace at the moment, so if I come on to short time working, um, short time working is ultimately um, where you are considering a reduction in employees working hours. Now, it is covered in the Employment Rights Act. Um, generally speaking, if you are to put somebody on short time working, it is a change to their terms and conditions of employment if you know, their contract normally states that they would work Monday to Friday nine till five. Um, and you can put, even in those circumstances, an employee on short time working, but unless your contract of employment specifically states that you can do that um, with adjustments to pay, then ultimately you have to pay them whilst on short time working at the same rate that you would pay them if they were in work full time. Um, similar on layoff provisions, and I'll cover that on the next slide. Um, ultimately, um, it really may help avoid a, a redundancy situation if you're able to perhaps have, if you had, for example, 10 employees in your workforce um, and your business needs at the moment is that you only need five, wouldn't it be ideal that you could just put all of those 10 onto short time working? Well, arguably you could, but the cost implication is if that isn't in the contract, you would still be paying them. So it could help to avoid redundancies, but ultimately it's a, a last resort. Um, again, I've said there, if, if it's included in the employee's contract, however, then you would be able to um, reduce pay. Um, there's no time limit on how long you can actually do this for. Um, there is a caveat and I'll cover that next. Um, but if it is in the contract of employment that you can um, actually put somebody on short time working, what you need to consider is that actually there is something called guarantee pay, which is also covered under the Employment Rights Act. Um, and that is £29 a day for five days, so up to £145. Um, for short time working, for the eligibility around short time working, um, an employee has to be um, employed continuously for one month um, at the point at which you start doing it um, but re reasonably be available for work as well so you know there is an expectation that they then become available on the days that they effectively are on the short time um, and not uh, ultimately refuse to do any other um, reasonable requests for work. Um, what I would really point out on this one though is Whilst it wouldn't make sense to do this now, obviously furlough is in place, it, broadly speaking, under its current scheme, if you like, until August. So this wouldn't be logical at the moment um, because you can't claim back the guarantee pay from the government, um, but you can claim the furlough money back. So this is something that you might consider um, effectively from October or the end of October when the furlough scheme um, completely ends. Um, I will cover on uh, the layoff now, primarily because there's a, a point that kind of links to both. Um, layoff provisions is if there's no work available. So assume, for example, that the government completely ends everything and lifts all restrictions and suddenly from the 1st of November, if you like, all businesses are expected to be kind of back up and running. But depending on the, your business, you might not actually have work available. So again, like the short time working, um, you are able to temporarily lay off workers. Um, again, this is a contractual issue because if it's not in the contract of employment, then laying off would be required to be on full pay. 
Um, if obviously you um, have it in your contract of employment, and I could almost guess many people don't because we almost don't foresee this as part of a, a business need. Um, but it, so if it's in the contract, you could then reduce it uh, in terms of pay and the employee ultimately um, would get that guarantee pay, which is £29 a day. Um, again, the eligibility is the same as short time working. But what is really worth considering before you look at these provisions is that after four weeks of either short time working um, or being laid off, um, or if you've done this, so short time working or layoff for six weeks in a 13 week period, then an employee can approach you and actually ask to be made redundant. So, you know, it's almost like you can use these, but it, it, the good practice would be don't use them as a way of delaying a redundancy ultimately because it can actually trigger a redundancy after that four or six week period. Um, again, the, the logic is keep them on furlough, absolutely, as long as you can, primarily again because that guarantee pay um, only lasts for, um, you know, that guarantee pay you can't claim back essentially from the government. So um, redundancy then, um, it's quite a big section, I apologise, and it's probably not as big as it could be, um, but certainly, again, uh, the signpost for this is the CIPD website um, and the ACAS website. Um, there's also lots of, you know, professional HR sites that run this type of information. Um, but ultimately, redundancy occurs in three scenarios. Um, obviously, if the business closes or ceases to trade anymore, then there is a, a logical trigger for redundancy. Um, all work, the workplace, and I kind of caveat that, when we talk about workplaces, most employees are employed um, with their terms and conditions stating that they are employed to work in a certain area. So if work ceases in that particular place, then there is an argument for redundancy. As an example, if you've got a business that runs in Wolverhampton, um, but you also have a business that runs in Manchester, um, and actually the, the business issue is around work that's done in Wolverhampton, but it's still going to carry on in Manchester. The, the, for the purposes of the employees in Wolverhampton, you could say that there's been a cessation or a stoppage to work needed in Wolverhampton. So that is another a trigger point for redundancy. Um, or the final one, which is I think where most businesses will find themselves um, at the moment, is that there's a reduced need. Um, because you know, depending on what business you're in, ultimately it might be that consumers are still not ready um, with confidence to go out into the big wide world, despite the fact that lockdown is, is kind of easing. Um, and even though, you know, you might be able to do your absolute best in terms of safeguarding and social distancing for your business, you know, consumers might just drop off. Um, you know, I, I'm sure for many, you know, they could open all the shops tomorrow and I'm not convinced I would be queuing up like it was in Ikea last week to get back in so it might be just that you've got a reduced need for the amount of staff you've got and obviously that triggers um, the, the need for redundancy. Um, one of the things that I kind of queried myself when I was looking into it is actually can we consult staff while on furlough um, because the, the logic is that you're going to have a redundancy plan that you don't kind of leave this till the first of November and then decide oh I need to make people redundant obviously as part of your process to reopen in businesses, um, you'll be kind of considering these things now. So it's absolutely okay to consult with staff whilst they are on furlough. Um, and it's a reasonable request. Um, obviously, logistics of those consultation meetings um, need to be thought through. So where possible, you know, it's okay to do this by the telephone. It's all right to do this, you know, using platforms such as Zoom or Microsoft Teams, um, ultimately as a way of facilitating the process. Um, again, just a reminder, it is a really emotive process um, and really it's a case of reasonableness when you are, you know, doing these things. Um, but communication is vital. Um, you know, depending on how many people you're going to make redundant, um, consultation uh, will vary. I'll come on to that in a second. Um, but a lot of the time, the consideration is actually, if if as an employee you are consulted with, you almost feel a little bit calmer about the situation. Um, so giving you know employees as much information uh, as possible is always a good thing. Um, 
what are the risks um, to a business in terms of redundancy? Um, quite a few. Um, one of the obvious ones is unfair dismissal um, claims. So where an employee has more than two years service or consecutive two years service, um, there is a potential depending on your process and the procedures you follow for unfair dismissal claims. Um, and one of the other big ones, um, and this is very much around your selection criteria, is the potential for claims of discrimination. So that actually I've been made redundant because I am female, I've been made redundant because I'm disabled, I've been made redundant because I'm, you know, um, a, a particular sexual orientation or race, you know, so absolutely procedure becomes vital. You could also end up with a contract of employment claim. So redundancy, um, one of the issues is that ultimately if they don't have two years service, whilst redundancy doesn't technically apply, um, terms and conditions of employment still apply. So if you have, were bringing somebody's employment contract to an end who perhaps isn't entitled to redundancy, um, if your previous contract of employment says that, you know, the statutory notice or a month's notice period, you need to make sure you're still adhering to those um, current policies, procedures and terms and conditions um, so you don't get a breach of contract claim essentially. Um, what I will say and it, one of those things is that and it's something that I've considered as well um, is what happens actually if I need to make business cuts now because my business doesn't need 20 staff but actually in three months time i don't know what that position is going to be and i'm concerned about you know making staff redundant now when in three months time needing to rehire um ultimately when we are talking about redundancies your paperwork absolutely needs to be able to justify a dismissal um, and your paper trial your paper trail is ultimately your um, objective justification for why you have made redundancies at a given point in time because the reality is our employment tribunals at the moment are backed up ridiculously. Um, the last I heard it was about 18 months to bring a claim to uh, the tribunal in Birmingham. So the reality is of the position is that you could make somebody redundant now um, in three to six months time. You could be brilliantly enjoying you know, a resurgence of your business and then suddenly taking people on. And then somebody goes to a, tri a tribunal in 12, 18 months and says, well, I was made redundant and three months later they were rehiring. So why was I made redundant? So actually making sure your paperwork demonstrates um, the diminishing requirement for staffing at that point in time to prevent, you know, issues like that being raised in an employment tribunal. Um, so definitely, obviously, consider at every time the protection to your business is the paperwork and the evidence that you've got to support and justify the decisions that you've reached as a business leader. Um, obviously, again, just coming back to that unfair dismissal, if you have an employee who has been employed for two years, then they can make a claim to an employment tribunal. If it's a discrimination claim, however, there is no length of service required. So um, you think, oh, well, it's OK, because they haven't been employed for two years. I could get rid of them if they're old or disabled or, you know, purple, yellow, green, whatever, you know, race, nationality. But the reality is discrimination claim, if that is the, the grounds that they're going to make in an employment tribunal, there is no limit on, you know, they could be employed for a week um, and, and be able to make that claim. So at all times, really, really be careful when you are considering your selection criteria to avoid um, claims of discrimination. Um, uh, the, the other thing to consider as well with the employment tribunal is that there's actually no cost to bring a claim to an employment tribunal. So fees for tribunals were outlawed in 2016, 17, sorry. Um, so lots of the, uh, you know, the reality is, and there has been a massive increase in claims in employment tribunals in the last couple of years, employees have nothing to lose by going to an employment tribunal. And um, access to justice means that they can literally lodge that claim um, and they can actually litigate in person. So they go to an empl employment tribunal against you without even needing a solicitor. So if they feel that they've um, been let go of unfairly um, and they've got the, the requisite service or they be believe they've been let go of because of a discriminatory element and um, you know they can go and raise a claim obviously um if they do raise a claim to an employment tribunal acas will get in touch with you because there is a, a conciliation 
expectation um, that you will mediate via ACAS in the first instance before ACAS will issue a certificate that says that then that claim can proceed to court. Um, so again, the, I can't stress enough the, the having everything documented around why you know a particular person has been made redundant is um, ultimately really important. Um, I, I also would say as well is whilst I signpost um, to ACAS and CIPD um, and other HR websites, um, legal advice is pretty much probably the best money you will ever spend um, and it might seem like I'm saying at the moment like go and spend a thousand pound on legal advice but um, the reality is it could actually be the best thousand pounds you'll ever spend um, it could be that it, your you know a solicitor could look at your current terms and conditions help you draft if you need to make changes or give advice to you if you do suddenly see yourself in receipt of a ET1 employment tribunal claim form um, so it's probably what wise if you do have something that seems particularly contentious um it's worth the investment in speaking to um a specialist legal advisor to help you along the way um in terms of procedure then obviously the procedure is critical um i've got on here consult consultation with individuals um or collective i'll come on to the collective in a second um when i say consultation there is actually re realistically more an announcement um because at the point at which you are considering uh, making people redundant and you need to announce uh, that position um, and then you need to be telling people um who is in that selection pool so the employees who are potentially going to be made redundant and actually the criteria you are going to use in determining which employees will be made redundant and the reason for me highlighting consultation is there is nothing wrong with actually consulting with staff and say we have to make redundancies um you know we we have to make redundancies because of xyz whatever the reason may be um, and uh, the reason for it is that, you know, we might have a cash flow issue or, you know, we, we can't face the wage bill that's coming um, and ask them to be involved in terms of um, the criteria. Um, and it is very much about winning the hearts and minds that if, if employees believe they've been part of the process that actually gathers up who is going to be made redundant and what the criteria is that's going to be chosen, they will believe that the process is fair um, and that, they, they will, you know, it will kind of enforce trust in you as an employer. Um, obviously, then once you have um, identified your selection pool, so who is going to potentially be made redundant, and you've considered your criteria, um, then what you need to do then is obviously start in terms of consulting. Um, what I will say on your criteria is be very, very careful, um, and best advice um, is always have multiple criteria for the reason for um, a dismissal or redundancy. Um, it would never be advisable. Um, I don't know if anybody's heard of that idea of last in, first out, or sometimes abbreviated to LIFO. Um, so if you're the last person employed, you're going to be the first one to go. The problem is with that is that it actually potentially leaves you in a position vulnerable to discrimination claims based on age discrimination, because it's not uncommon that actually the, the latest people to join our business are potentially the youngest. Um, so a consideration there. Um, also, when you are obviously going through the process of consultation with members of staff, um, it's worth considering offers of alternative employment. Um, so you could look to um, offer somebody a different uh, role. With the consideration of offers of alternative employment, um, an employee can reasonably refuse, and that reasonable word comes up in law so often. Um, but if you did offer somebody um, who was going to be made with an alternative role um, they have a right to a trial period in that role of four weeks so if during that period they don't actually like the role that you are then asking them to to do um, they could then take redundancy as an option um, when we're talking about procedure as well um, this is something to be really mindful of um, in terms of a time frame, so how quickly can you make employees redundant? So if you are going to be making up to 19 employees redundant, there is no time frame. Again, it comes down to that word of reasonable. So um, and reasonable does depend on the size of your business and you know the nature of the business that you carry out. Um, you know, sometimes you know two weeks is effective. I've also seen it, and case laws approved it as a week. Um, but the logic is, if you were going to have meaningful consultation with employees, which gives them time to consider the selection pool and the selection criteria, 
it's questionable whether you could bring them in and have that meeting and then let them go on the next day. But legally, you could. There is no time frame. If you are um, considering making 20 or more staff redundant, then um, you need to co uh, consult both collectively um, as a whole with your audio employees um, and individually as well. So 20 to 99 staff redundancies, you would need to consult with them at least 30 days before you anticipate the first dismissal. Um, and if you are losing over 100 staff, and I really hope you aren't, um, at least 45 days before the first dismissal. Um, as part of the process, though, there is no set number of meetings that you would have to have. Um, I would say good practice is absolutely a minimum of two. One where you discuss, you know, the pool and the criteria, and then one where you discuss with them individually. Um, you know, if there's alternative, uh, sorry, alternative forms of employment or what they think that you could do as a business. Um, to avoid redundancies because actually your staff um, a lot of the time are you know well versed in how your business runs um, and there's lots of information you can glean from employees so um, at least two meetings would be really really good practice. Um, in terms of collective consultation I'll be very quick so I'm conscious of time. Um, if you have more than 20 employees that you are considering making redundancies to, um, then consultation needs to take place between you and an elected representative. So uh, if we're talking elected rep, uh, put it out to, if you don't have one at the moment, put it out to your um, staff and say we need a, you know, a rep to discuss a collective redundancy with and they can nominate one. Um, if you have trade union um, agreement a recognition in your workplace then obviously the logical point is is to bring this trade union in what is absolutely critical is that you really need to notify the redundancy payment service um, before a consultation starts okay and the deadline of notice depends on the number of proposed redundancies so at least 45 days if it's over 100 or 30 if it's between 20 and 99 and again if you've got you know a bit a big uh, number of staff being made redundant. Again, consultation with these on ways that you can avoid uh, redundancy. Um, if you fail to consult employees, and this is critical, um, with as part of a redundancy process, um, we are also almost guaranteed result in an automatic unfair dismissal. Um, and unfair dismissal remedies in a tribunal um, are pretty much, I think, about £85,000. Um, obviously, it depends on salary and so on. But the reality is, is that getting something wrong now um, could massively cost your business um, in the long run. And like I said, it could be two years from now before an employee actually makes it to a tribunal and suddenly you survive the pandemic and then suddenly you're you, you know, hit with a massive legal bill. Um, and settlement to an employee. So absolutely procedure becomes critical. Um, whilst I recognise that consultation, um, it doesn't have to end in an agreement, you don't have to consult with someone and agree, um, but it really needs to be carried out um, transparently and with an idea that you're actually going to listen. It, you shouldn't start consultancy with that idea of, well, you're already going to be going anyway. I, you know, be open minded to the actual process as well um, and kind of a, come to it with the idea that you might actually be able to kind of reach agreement. What I will say with collective redundancy is because of the duties that are employed, um, obliged uh, as an employer, you're obliged to do a lot more in collective consultation. Um, it is really, really, really critical that you actually take legal advice on this one. Um, some last points on uh, procedure. You obviously have to identify um, the at-risk members of staff, um, so by job role, for example, um, and then obviously um, that's the selection pool. Um, and then obviously you, your criteria becomes really, really, really important. So like I said, trying to avoid discrimination claims rather than just, you, it would be really dangerous if you just looked at absence records, for example. So you thought, well, well, I'll get rid of everybody who's been off in the last two years sick. The problem is with that is that the people who have been off sick most in your organisation over the last two years are those employees who are likely to be disabled or potentially be disabled. So when you are considering your criteria, make sure that it covers lots of different elements. So, for example, the standard of work that they've been doing um, since they've been employed, any appraisals that you might have had. Um, any skills, qualifications or experience, because um, sadly there's nothing wrong with keeping 
um, the most qualified, the most um, experienced members of staff through this. Um, attendance you can use, um, but be mindful that you might need to make a reasonable adjustment in terms of attend, you know, man, looking at attendance figures to accommodate people who have a disability. Um, so very careful, obviously, without saying anything to do with uh, attendance, for example, if you had a, a pregnant worker who's had time off for antenatal, don't don't count that. Um, so you, if, for example, one of those employees brought a claim, you could say, well, we disregarded that as part of the process. I, I am not saying don't sack people who have you know, disability or have pregnancy or have, um, but if, you know, those types of um, categories of employees fall into, pe you know, the, the, sorry, get my words out, if they fall into the, the number of people you're going to make redundant, that's fine, just make sure it's well documented and that you're able to demonstrate, should you need to, in an employment tribunal, that the reason for their dismissal, which ultimately a redundancy is, is not linked to that particular protected characteristic, but it's actually linked to the fair criteria that you've established. Um, Obviously, once you've gone through the, the meetings, and I said on the previous couple of slides, um, at least two, but I've seen, you know, lawyers advocate for five, six, seven meetings. You know, it is really dependent on your business, the size of your business and so on. But once you've done that and ultimately you've reached a decision as a business, um, then you need to confirm the dismissal by reason of redundancy and it's best to do this both verbally and then follow it up with um, a letter that confirms this. Now obviously if you are made redundant um, there is an appeal process um, which is enshrined in law um, so it's always best if for example you are a company director um, that you perhaps aren't involved in the process of redundancy because there needs to be an appeal process um, that's kind of like higher than the person who ultimately makes that dismissal. Um, so consider who is available for appeal um, and obviously um, and goes without saying when you are going through the consultation period then make sure you are telling your staff what they will be entitled to in terms of payments. Um, obviously notice periods still stand so um, if you want to get rid of uh, your staff or you want to make them redundant um, with immediate effect please note that you would still need to pay the notice period. Now you don't have to make them work it. Um, what we have there is pylon to pay in lieu of notice, um, or obviously um, you could ask them to carry on and work the notice period. In terms of payments, um, if they are under 22 years old, then it's half a week's pay for each full year of service with you. This goes up to one week's full pay if they're over 22 but under 41. Um, one and a half weeks pay if they are 41 or old, older and the maximum time period for employment will be 20 years. So currently um, pay is capped at, sorry, um, redundancy pay is capped at £16,140. Um, um, ultimately, the more um, open and transparent your redundancy process and procedures are, um, the more your employees will trust it's fair and then you know, less likely to bring an employment tribunal claim off the back of it if they genuinely believe um, it wasn't kind of like a target on your back or this is a brilliant way that we've got rid of, you know, employees. Um, so making sure all the way through that those procedures are fair. So um, obviously, just to summary, quick conclusions. Um, when you are considering, obviously, your return bringing people back to work, then obviously consider your selection process for who comes back. Um, there is temporary options within the um, Employment Rights Act in terms of um, temporary or permanent uh, reduction in work in terms of hours or ultimately uh, laying off provisions. But again, check your terms and conditions of employment and if need be, take your terms and conditions currently along to a lawyer and just say, you know, anything you can advise. Um, consider advice and support for employees. Like I've said, this is, you know, really an emotive time. So if you do have, you know, well-being initiatives, um, now's the time to kind of reiterate those to staff. Um, ultimately, again, take advice, um, timing um, on when the best time to do this is, um, that's specific to your business and your structure. Um, and a, a just to leave you with a really good phrase that I've heard along the way, um, penny wise and pound foolish, so many times that we will make decisions thinking I can't afford to do this now. 
um, and it's that idea of being penny wise. But ultimately, with, with the law, because of the potential issues around all of these uh, redundancy, you know, laying off, breach of contract claims, um, constructive dismissal claims, um, it, it is always best to spend a little bit now rather than potentially a massive um, payout later on. I'd like to thank you for listening. I appreciate it's probably run over and I apologise, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Lovely. Thank you, Vicky. Got some questions. Um, Hina, first one, does the 10th of June date only apply to employees who've been on the furlough scheme? They have an employee who is on furlough. They have two to three days of work they need them to complete, but they don't actually have any work until July. So they're calling them back out of furlough on Monday, the 8th of June. And then should they put them back onto furlough by the 10th of June, as the work can be done in two days, or can they put them back on furlough on Thursday, the 11th of June? No, you would need to put them back onto furlough if you take them off. Um, I think the 10th of June is ultimately the regist last registration date for anybody who's going to be joining the scheme. But the safest advice, if you can get your employee to do it, um, that little bit of work you need them to do before the 10th and get them back registered, um, because um, otherwise by the 11th you wouldn't be able to put them back on it and therefore you would be faced with having to um, make earlier decisions with regards to this employee than you would previously. So save advice, if you are going to ask them to return, um, get them reset up by, by the 10th. Okay, next question. Um, is it okay to issue letters on the same date recalling them from furlough and then another letter stating we'll place them back on furlough after two days? I assume what they mean is the two letters issued on the same day? Uh, it, so can you ever ask that question and mute for me and just have a chat with me? It becomes quite... Yeah, you're unmuted. Hi, Vicky. Um, Hi. So the question's from me. So all of a sudden we've just got some um, maintenance work that we want this person to do and um, you know we're going to be speaking them to them today letting them know to come in for two days yeah. um, but also I've, I've, um, I've seen guidance around that I mean if you are putting someone back on furlough make sure you don't issue the date on the 10th get that paperwork before the 10th so that's the reason why I'm asking if we're obviously we're going to say to them, we've only got two days work for you. Yeah. Um, you are going to be going back on furlough on the on the Wednesday. And I just wanted to make sure that there was no legal sort of um, complication if we're issuing obviously a letter on the 5th of June saying we're recalling you from furlough. And then we're issuing another letter, which is the 5th of June saying, you know, we're putting you back on furlough. And obviously, you know, you're going to be agreeing to these terms. Um, is that OK? Yeah, or do Absolutely fine. All I would say is that obviously when you return them, when you bring them back yeah. from furlough, um, they obviously, I'm hoping is not going to disagree and say, no, I'm not coming back. Um, because obviously that would just create a yes. bigger set of issues. But there's no problem with sign, sending a letter saying, please come back and send in a letter saying, but from this date, you're going to be back on furlough. Just make mm -hmm. sure you get agreement from the employee that they're happy to go back on furlough. Yes, we will yes. do that. That's no absolutely worries. fine. Okay. And do we, obviously, you know, we have to put in the, the letter a deadline. Um, you know, I guess we can put Monday or Tuesday. I mean, this employee is expecting a call from us. We have touched on it that, you know, we're, we're, we're going through and seeing what we need to be done. Um, so I take it that's fine to put deadline Monday or Tuesday. Okay. I know these are little, little things, but then you start link, looking into it and you... I, and I think the problem is at the minute, there's quite a lot of information out there that... Um, I've seen quite a lot of it in the fake news argument where there's some things out there where guidance isn't clear. Um, but I, what I would say is, uh, you know, obviously, bearing in mind the email address there um, that's up on the screen at the moment is directly to the team who look after executive education. So if you do have any queries um, and you want a quick answer, then feel free. Uh, uh, this will go to Emma and Emma can pick up any questions. But if you are looking for, you know, any guidance, like I said, ACAS and the CIPD is probably your safest bets at the moment. Or okay. Um, there are lots and lots of solicitors who do have quite a lot of extensive guidance online and the solicitors practices are generally quite safe. Um, okay. What I would just do is kind of avoid the Google searching in terms of you might end up with some, you know, sadly seeing some various blogs where people are interpreting the legislation and the guidance is out there. Okay, brilliant. Correct, Thank you, you Vicky. Fine. No worries. Thank you. Thank you. Some more questions. Um, okay. I don't know whether, Hina, do you want to, as you still... 
um, oh no, yeah, you're on. Do you want to ask your questions or do you want me to ask them for you? Because I know you've got another couple of questions. Yeah, um, I'll quickly cover this. And, and again, I'm just looking too much on wording again. And um, I think I attended this webinar and they were just saying, like, in the letters, never promise that, you know, you'll be on the scheme for as long as the scheme is running. And I just wanted to check something that in, in our letters we're putting, you will be a furloughed worker as long as we are unable to provide you with work and are enrolled on the scheme. Yeah. My understanding of this is when we say you are enrolled on the scheme, it's an employer's choice. So we choose when we choose to put you on the scheme, it doesn't mean for how long the scheme will be running. I mean, is this correct? Uh, yeah, you're fine. I mean, the problem is when, uh, and what I do recognise the issue here is that when we first heard about the furlough scheme, we kind of all anticipated that it yes. would change at the end of June. And then obviously when the Chancellor extended the scheme, suddenly yes. it throws up, uh, I don't know what we're doing. Um, but the reality is, um, did, did your um, employees sign agreement to that letter that you sent out? Yes, the first okay. one, we, we agreed, um, we, we thought, um, you know, we went through the process and, 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 and everyone agreed to it. And as I said, at the time when we sent them in March, we didn't know how long the scheme was going to be for. And um, But now I'm looking at the wording and obviously we're doing another letter, a second furlough letter. And just to make sure that enrolled on the scheme, I mean, I take it as, as long as the employer enrolls you on, it's not yeah. an automatic uh, yeah. right. Do you read it same as how I read? I, I would, I would read. I mean, don't get me wrong. The, the the one biggest issue with law is that it's constantly open for debate, and law law changes um, as and when people are prepared to fight it. But what I would suggest is that you are safe enough. If you are considering now, obviously reissuing letters with regards to changes to furlough, mm -hmm. what I would suggest is just stipulate in there that obviously um, employees can be recalled at any time because mm -hmm. um, that's pretty safe or within a reasonable time frame um, mm -hmm. and that um, furlough scheme is not guaranteed for as long as the furlough scheme runs um, mm -hmm. but as the business um, you know deems it necessary um, mm -hmm. and there's nothing wrong with attaching a pro forma that says you know please can um, mm -hmm. uh, employees sign you know confirm or respond to an email or you know whatever it may be an electronic signature would be fine Mm -hmm. uh, but you. I wouldn't be too concerned with the words that you've put out. No, not not all, not a worry. Okay, thank you, thank you again. Um, I have to go. This has been really good. Thank you so much. I've just got another meeting at three. Um, but hopefully, will we be will we be getting a recording of today's session? You will. Yeah, at the end of the okay. session, we'll send it out to the email that you booked on with. So you'll you'll have okay. it. I'll also okay. ask the last question that you've got as well now have I? And it's on the recording, so you'll get it okay. when you get the recording. All right, brilliant. Thanks for joining us. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Last question then, and then I've got one. Can you use the um, furlough government grant towards redundancy payments, but you have to top up to 100%? <gasps> redundancy pay is something that you have to... Um, uh, sorry, get my words out now. Redundancy pay is something that you have to actually fund yourself as a business. I mean, the logic, and this is a really, really sticky situation. The logic is that obviously if you are claiming current furlough um, or the grant from the government, then there is an element that you will claim in the month that you are potentially making them redundant. What you cannot do at any point is obviously claim beyond that person's last date of work. Otherwise you would be um, unlawfully claiming it. In essence, you'd be in breach of the HMRC guidelines. Um, I, I, I've had this as well, where we've heard of uh, people being on holiday is a very similar thing. So if you know, you should be actively encouraging your employees who are currently on furlough to take holidays at the moment, um, notwithstanding that you would have to pay them 100% while they are on leave. Um, even if you've agreed uh, for members of staff to be on furlough at 80% of their wages, the moment they go on to holiday, um, they would then need to be paid at 100%, otherwise you're facing unlawful deduction of wages claims. Um, and then questions have arisen around, well, hang on a minute, if they're on furlough, can I still claim that? Well, yes, you can. Um, that, that, that's been clear in the guidance. So if you are claiming 80% um, and they're on holiday, that's fine. You just make up the difference. Um, obviously, what you've got to be mindful of with redundancy is that you still have an obligation to pay um, the notice period um, with redundancy running parallel. So if, for example, just to put some dates and to try and make sense, if you were considering um, going through the process um, in June, you were getting rid of five employees. So logically, you could do this quite quickly. So say you started your consultation now with a view that by the 30th of June, you would be given notice. Um, there wouldn't be anything wrong with you claiming 
you know the the july payment because they're still technically employed at that point albeit working their notice period if you had for example a month's notice but beyond that absolutely not because technically you wouldn't you'd be claiming for somebody who you don't no longer employ and um, and that would go against the whole point of the job retention scheme which is ultimately to try and keep people in work as long as possible so be careful i appreciate redundancy is not actually easy because the reality is lots of people are considering redundancies because ultimately there might be cash flow issues with your business but ultimately making people redundant is actually you know quite a big cost if you've got people who've been employed for quite a while um or are in you know the over 41 age bracket it can be quite uh, quite a cost to make and that's something that you have to um fun for yourself at the moment um what i will say and i haven't mentioned it and i do apologize and i appreciate um that lots of people might have people who are employed on i hate the term flexible contracts but zero hours effectively um obviously uh redundancy wouldn't apply for these um with uh people who are on zero hours contracts um you don't um, off, have to offer them work and I will caveat that by saying be very careful if you have had somebody who is on a zero hours contract by term if you look at their terms and conditions of employment it says you are on zero hours because if you've had employed them for that long sort of like three or four years under a you know a flexible contract or zero hours contract but they've been doing repeatedly 40 hours work for you they've never refused work when you've offered it to them you've regularly offered work they're on your payroll um you know they've done training you're in control of them they wear a uniform you know all the the common law tests for it, worker status um, just be mindful that those who are zero hours contracts could be deemed to be classed as, as, as an employee and therefore um, receive full statutory protection rights as an employee. So just another uh, thing to consider. I hope that helps, answers the question. I'm sure it does, Vicky. Uh, one more. You mentioned changing is an employer contract. If an employer has had a benefit, uh, honorarium payment or um, private health care for example and it, it's not part of their contract of employment but it's something they've received for over a year can the employer stop the payment the additional benefit immediately um, or do they have to phase it out over a period of time as a way of helping their cash flow okay um, it's an interesting question and the reason I say that is because what happens with law um, is that there is standard terms and conditions so for example your salary is absolutely a fundamental part of your employment contract and then you have these things like additional benefits that might not be in the contract but actually if something happens for kind of long enough you it almost becomes what we call implied into the contract so it's one of those areas um, that whilst it might not be in the terms and conditions therefore an employer could argue well I can get rid of it tomorrow because ultimately it's not contractual there could be an argument the other side that says actually if it's taken place for long enough it becomes implied in the contract of employment as a terms and conditions or um, custom and practice uh, could kick in and um, it could be argued that therefore again it becomes contractual so I suppose it would depend on the, the nature of the business um, and the nature of the benefit we're talking about I mean Arguably, if it was, for example, a company car, you'd argue it's almost contractual because ultimately you will have been paying tax on the benefit and so on. If it's something like um, retail benefits or so on, um, then arguably it's something that could go a little bit easier. But again, I come back to the HR best practice things. Um, if you are considering taking something away that is not a fundamental element of that contract, it's worth um, consulting, discuss, um, agree. Um, and, and explain the rationale behind the decisions that you're trying to reach as a business. Okay, thank you very much. Does anybody else have any questions? I just quick drink. <laughs> you can unmute, I'll unmute everybody if you haven't already unmuted in case you want to ask any more questions. No? Okay then. Well, thank you very much for attending uh, this afternoon. Um, if you've got any more questions, as Vicky has said, the number on the, uh, the email address on the screen, drop your questions into an email and we'll do our best to help you. There are additional e-clinics happening over the next uh, month or so, so please do keep an eye open for those and register if you're able to. We'd welcome some feedback, so uh, again, use the email address to uh, send us some feedback on what you thought about the workshop and any suggestions you've got for any other workshops. If nobody's got anything else to add, I'll end uh, the recording and the meeting. Thank you very much for attending and hope everybody has a lovely weekend. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye.